Okay. I have to say, it's mostly the boots, but I'm going to talk to you today about body language. And um, first, let's just um, talk a little bit about how body language, <laughs> our nonverbal behaviors really, really influence the inferences that other people make about us. So people mostly, from our nonverbal behaviors, are inferring things like, how strong is this person? How trustworthy is this person? How competent is this person? Um, how much do I like this person? And, and these inferences are responsible for really important outcomes. And we make them quickly, sometimes in a split second. And inferences from nonverbal behaviors like how smart do I think this person is? They predict things like election outcomes. They predict who gets hired, who gets promoted, who gets asked out on a date. So all kinds of outcomes are determined by nonverbal behaviors, and that process happens pretty quickly. But I'm going to focus today um, on specific nonverbal behaviors. And before I do that, I want to ask you right now to think about what are you doing with your bodies. So how many of you have your arms crossed or your legs crossed or even your ankles crossed? Um, how many of you are making yourself smaller so that you don't bump into the person next to you? How many people are sprawled out and actually have their arm draped on the chair next to them or their knees spread? So I want you to pay attention to that. And I think, I hope that in 10 minutes I'm going to convince you that if you tweak your nonverbal behaviors in really pretty easy and simple ways for a short period of time, it's going to make you feel more powerful through physiological changes in your body. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So here are some examples of... Um, <laughs> So, so what, what I want you to note about these is that they are all very open and expansive. So those are the two sort of um, uh, criteria that determine whether it's a power pose, whether you're open and you're expanding your body. All of these, I think, are examples of, um, of power posing, reflecting power that you already have or a victory that you feel. So people do this, I mean, this is very common after, after victories, they put their arms up, you know, or when you're generally feeling powerful, you're more likely to do something like this. You feel open, you feel disinhibited. Um, so it reflects power, it's also used to communicate power. So uh, I'm sure uh, that, you know, the, you have the LBJ treatment up at the top there. So again, it's making yourself bigger, getting in other people's space, um, reaching out, so it's used to reflect power and to communicate power. Um, and this is true not just uh, for humans, but also for non-human animals. This is just one example. But you have you know, primates who will bulge their chest to make themselves bigger. The peacock fanning his tail feathers. You have even cats will idle sideways and raise their back to make themselves look bigger. So th this is common across uh, both human and non-human animals. Um, now, on the other hand, powerlessness is um, reflected and communicated through these contractive closed postures. So this is, I mean, this is a very sad, powerless person, but this is an example. And I mean, it really is just everyday things that you do, like crossing your arms, also touching your face and touching your neck. This is really, really communicates powerlessness. Anything that you do that makes you smaller and hunching your shoulders, um, this is about powerlessness. It reflects it and it reinforces it. So we know already that power causes power posing. So when you possess power, um, whether it's short term or long term, or when you're communicating power, you do things like this. You power pose. You, you do the Wonder Woman pose. Um, but what we wanted to know was whether you could fake it till you make it. So can you do the opposite? And um, I want to tell you a little bit about how we got to this. So my main collaborator, who I'm so sorry can't be here with me, but Dana Carney uh, um, and I, both teach in business schools. And um, you may not know this, but, but in the MBA classroom, about half of your grade is determined by participation. We both were concerned about the gender grade gap and wondering you know, what's going on. Are, are women participating less? And not just women, but are really are non-mainstream white men participating less? So people who are not white men coming from finance backgrounds. There seems to be a gap. 
And we both noticed that, that these people who are participating less are engaging in more of these contractive closed postures. Now, let me just say and acknowledge, of course it's very possible that you're not calling on those people because they're doing that. But we felt like there was actually more to it, that that was not the only thing happening. That if we could get them to spread out, we might actually get them to participate more. And so you might wonder why this, this, why would we predict something like this? It's a little bit counterintuitive. And I'm gonna give you two little pieces of research that led to this prediction. The first is that we know already that feeling happy makes you smile. And this is a natural Duchenne smile where the, the, the muscles around the eyes are contracting. But um, researchers have, have also shown that, that making someone smile like this makes them happy, even when they don't feel happy. Asking them to smile like this makes them happy very quickly, and we call that facial feedback. So we know that our nonverbals both reflect and reinforce feelings. The second is um, a little, uh, it might seem like it's coming out of nowhere, but um, so when you think about primate hierarchies, the alpha male tends to have high testosterone and low cortisol. And from a Darwinian perspective, you know, the assumption is that, that that is the individual that has the highest innate basal testosterone and the lowest innate basal cortisol. But primatologists have discovered, you know, in the last decade or so, that if an alpha has to be taken over, if, if, if an alpha is lost and another individual has to ascend and become the alpha, this is what they find. Over just a few days, that individual's testosterone rises and his cortisol drops. Similarly, if for some reason a primate is pushed to the bottom of the hierarchy, you have the opposite. His testosterone decreases and his cortisol rises. And now let me say a word about testosterone and cortisol. Testosterone is what we call the dominance hormone. It's related to confidence, um, dominance, aggressiveness. Cortisol is related to stress. So obviously, lower cortisol um, means you're less stressed out both in the moment and you know, over the long term. It really can sort of erode your health over the long term. And low cortisol is, it, testosterone is clearly associated with power. We've known that for a while. Cortisol is associated with lo, low status if your cortisol is high. So therefore, um, it seems to be that this endocrine profile of high testosterone and low cortisol is the best neuroendocrine profile for effective leadership. And indeed, in the last year, researchers have shown that the best leaders have relatively high testosterone and relatively low cortisol, because what is that? That's a confident person who can go into a stressful situation that's competitive um, and still feel confident and not react to the stress. So you want a calm, confident leader. So we felt that it's possible that if you can change a role, like taking over the alpha position, or maybe taking the corner office, it's also possible that you could just change people's um, feelings of power through these minimal changes. So let me tell you what we did um, in this study. So first, um, people come into the lab. So let's take this uh, female participant. And we first take a saliva sample, and that's our time one hormone sample. It's very easy, they just spit into a little vial. They then, for two minutes, take on two high power poses. So one minute each, they're just asked to sit in these certain positions. They don't look at pictures because we don't wanna prime them with a concept of power. We describe to them how to sit. This is just one example of a high power pose. Um, two minutes. After that, they, they fill out some questionnaires, we ask them how powerful they feel, and we also give them an opportunity to gamble. Because when people feel powerful, they're much more risk tolerant. And this is a gamble where they are, they are endowed with $2, and they can roll a die and have a 50-50 chance of increasing that to $4. So uh, that's, our, that's our risk tolerance measure. And then we take, after about 17 minutes, which is the right amount of time between these time one and time two samples, we take another hormone sample because we wanna know what their baseline levels are. Half of their participants are randomly assigned to that, half of them are randomly assigned to this condition. And uh, in this condition, they take on two low power poses instead, same thing. This is what we find on risk tolerance. We find that the high power posers um, are significantly more likely to take the gamble. But uh, what, what's more interesting to us is this. So this is their change in testosterone and cortisol. Two minutes in a high power pose makes your testosterone rise significantly and your cortisol drop significantly. Two minutes in a low power pose does the opposite. Two minutes. 
And I just want to say, this is in a room alone. So they're not getting feedback. It's not like they're standing like this and people are like, wow, she's really powerful. You know, <laughs> that's, not, that's not what's happening. You know, they're not getting that feedback and going, oh, I must be powerful. Like, this is really reinforcing. They're sitting alone in a room. Okay, so you might ask, all right, okay, so we've, you get these effects. So what does that mean, you know, for sitting in the classroom, going into a job interview, a venture capital pitch, going in to make a pitch to potential funders? What do you do? Do you go in and do you, you know, um, do you sit like this? <laughs> uh, because, you know, um, I would say probably not. Um, I also study gender stereotypes and cultural norms, and um, I think it would be hazardous for me to advise anyone, especially women, to go in and do this. And you may like it or not, but there are gender stereotypes that do limit what we can do in the interactions and how, what inferences people draw. Um, so, so I would say no. So what we wanted to show next was that just doing this before you go into a room does change your performance in a significant way. Not only does it change your hormones, but it actually makes you perform better. So in the second study, uh, we again have the high and low power poses, two minutes each, and this is what happens this time. You go in, you do these power poses, and then we subject you to what's called the Trier Social Stress Test. And this is, this is um, um, something that's used in the lab to really increase people's cortisol, and I'll tell you what's stressful about it. You are told you have five minutes to write a speech, that's stressful, and the speech is about your dream job, and you are supposed to convince two evaluators why you are suited for this dream job, but you cannot lie or misrepresent yourself. These two evaluators are gonna be evaluating you with clipboards in real time as you give this speech, and you're gonna be filmed, and then other people will evaluate you later. Okay, so wait, so that's, that's, that's stressful, because we know that people are terrified of public speaking. I'm actually terrified right now, but um, I'm not anymore, but I used to be. But so, so, um, so what happens though, that's not the most stressful thing. What's most stressful about it is that these two evaluators are trained to sit here like this. No nonverbal feedback, totally neutral expression, no nodding, no movement, no shows of approval or even disapproval. Only they're locked on to you, they're watching you, they're not spacing out and they're giving you no nonverbals. This is very stressful. Okay, so we do again, two low power poses or high power poses before this job interview where people are, are basically saying you stink, you know, with their nonverbals. And um, again, they're not in these poses while they're in the job interview, they do them before. What we find is this, we then take these videos, have two coders who are hypothesis and condition blind, code them on a variety of nonverbals, all kinds of performance measures, and we just find these whopping effects. When you do this two minutes before and you go in, these, these hypothesis blind coders are like, hire her. And when you do this, they say, no way, don't hire this person. And this is driven, by the way, by changes in the extent to which these people are engaging and enthusiastic and, and charismatic. So that's mediating this relationship. So if you pose like that and then you go in, you're much more excited about what you're doing. And that's what's coming across. The content doesn't matter. What you're saying doesn't matter. And this actually, <laughs> I'm not, listen, I, I'm not saying that it never does, but th th this, is, this lines up this lines up, I'm actually saying nothing, right? It's just nonsense. <laughs> but you're all like laughing, it's amazing. So, but, um, but, but, but this lines up with um, some data that, that's not yet published, a dissertation um, by a student at Boston College who looked at 180 venture capital pitches. They were one or two minutes long. She's a nonverbals expert. She coded them on a lot of different variables. And she found that the two best predictors, she also looked at content of the pitches, of who got the VC money, and not many people get VC money, were enthusiasm, genuine enthusiasm, and lack of awkwardness. So if you believe in your idea and you can communicate that, that's what matters, and that seems to be what was coming across in this case. So here are the takeaways. First, in practice, um, prepare in advance only if it's for a few minutes. Okay, so what do people do before they go into a job interview? They're sitting down, I wish I had a chair, like this, and they're looking at their iPhone. They're making themselves as small as possible. 
It's the last thing you want to do. Instead, go to a bathroom stall and stretch out. Like, wa just walk around, be moving, have your feet spread, you know, have your arms spread, be reaching out. If you're in your own office, be, put your feet up on the desk. No one's watching you. Do whatever you want to do. You know, the cultural and gender norms don't matter. If, you're, if you have some space that's private, do that before you go into the interview, before you give the speech, before you give the pitch. Two minutes. Um, second, during the, the interaction, you want to expand without dominating or without complimenting. So people tend to do one of two things. They either go in and they think they've got to own the whole room, but really what they're doing is like stealing the room. And people are like, I don't like this guy, you know? So um, that's, that's, so you want to go into that situation. If somebody has higher, if, say you go into a job interview and you already have lower power, you don't want to go in and try to be the most dominant person in the room. Um, but the other thing that people do is they compliment. When they go in to somebody who has higher status, they tend to exaggerate the difference by making themselves even smaller. So I want, I want to say don't do either of those things. Instead, go in and be as big as you can be comfortably. Square off your shoulders, stand with your feet apart. If you have to sit, try to rest your arms on the arms of the chair. That will prevent you from doing this. Um, if you have a prop, I know, sorry, I keep touching this. Um, if you have a prop like a whiteboard or something, put your hand on it or the back of a chair. Anything that forces you to stretch out, that's what you want to do when you're in the room without really coming across as super dominant. But, but here, there's a big picture takeaway that I think is particularly relevant, especially to a lot of what the fellows have been talking about to, um, in the last couple of days. What other minimal manipulations can empower people? I mean, this is two minutes in a pose, and it leads to these outcomes for both. By the way, this is not moderated by gender. This is for women and men, and for people of different races. So what other minim minimal manipulations can we come up with that are going to lead people to feel more powerful, um, to feel more confident, to feel more um, engaging and warm and, and, um, and excited about what they're doing? Um, and I, uh, I think I'm going to stop there. Wonder Woman, now the world is ready for you.